Hello, BookTube. It's Wednesday, and that means epic comic book Wednesday, uh, when Michael K. Vaughn and I combine the forces of stately Vaughn Manor and Hyde Cottage to talk about comic books on which we have both wasted our youth's significant portions of our adulthood. <laughs> uh, Michael started this off on his channel uh, by talking about Marvel's epic collection. A full color paperback reprint series that they do that's not in chronological order. Uh, they've been doing it for years. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's they're they're pricey. They're forty or forty five dollars, but you get your money's worth. You get high quality paper, full color reproductions, tons of extras. Uh, and because they're not chronological, it frees the editors of the epic line to bounce all around, depending on what's hot in the Marvel Cinematic Universe or what. Uh, properties they want to advance uh, as IPs for that cinematic universe, or even uh, what runs the creators and editors themselves like, <laughs> having nothing to do with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, and M Michael and I have decided or that we, we aren't going to restrict ourselves to the epic collections, or even to Marvel Comics, that so we'll go all over. Uh, the comic book world where we have done so much reading, but we're moving back today to our roots, as we often do, uh, with an epic collection. Uh, I'm letting Michael pick these things. He's doing the, the choosing for each week, and he picked a winner this time around. This is the Marvel epic collection, The Avengers, Once an Avenger. Uh, with credits there at the bottom, you can see Stan Lee, uh, Roy Thomas did a lot of the scripting, a lot of the co-plotting for a lot of these issues, uh, and Don Heck does uh, all of the artwork. Sometimes he's inked by Bill Everett, who's a really talented artist. Sometimes he's inked by John Romita Sr., who's also a really talented artist. Sometimes he's inked just by professional inkers, uh, like uh, Frank Giacoa is the one who does most of the inks in this issue, I think. And this collects Avengers 21 through 40. Uh, and it is the continuation of the epic storyline that started when Stan Lee took a huge gamble uh, with the Avengers. The Avengers started out as a, as a super team of heavy hitters. There was Ant-Man and the Wasp, true. There was Henry, Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne, who could shrink to insect size, and, and Hank Pym could talk to insects uh, through cybernetic circuitry in his helmet. Uh, but other than them, there was Iron Man, and Thor and the Hulk. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter who their teammates are. There's not much that can beat a trio like that. Um, and more importantly, Thor, Iron Man, and the Hulk were all popular in their own features. Ant-Man and the Wasp were too, but not nearly as much. Uh, Stanley decided to bring them all together. And then after a little while, after no more than a year, a little more than a year, he decided to change that completely. And, uh, change the team's lineup. And this isn't, for instance, the Fantastic Four, who are family, so you can't really change the lineup all that much from that original core group, although Roy Thomas and other writers managed to do that over the years. This is a team that banded together to live off Tony Stark. <laughs> Tony Stark gives them all sorts of uh, technology. He gives them the use of his mansion in New York as their headquarters. He gives them uh, the jets that they fly around in and the, the radio and computer technology that they use. And in exchange for that, they become a fighting team. They fight supervillains. They fight uh, super disasters and things like that. Uh, and at one point, Stan Lee decided to, at one point early in, the, in their adventures, the, Aven the Avengers find Captain America in suspended animation from World War II. And they thaw him out, and he just goes right back to being Captain America. No trauma at all. He just becomes a key member of the team. And so overwhelmingly popular with readers uh, that Stan Lee took a gamble and had uh, Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne and Iron Man and Thor leave the team. The Hulk had already left. He left pretty early on. Uh, leaving Captain America alone with the responsibility of forming a new team. Uh, and it's only when you look back and realize what Stan Lee could have done. He had complete power over the Marvel lineup here. Uh, there were, I mean, Roy Thomas did a lot of, gave him a lot of help with writing and plotting, and so did a few other writers. But it, he had complete power over his stable of characters, most of whom he had created. 
if he'd wanted to. Having created a story in which Captain America is forced to rebuild the team, look at what he could have done, right? The team could have, con have consisted of other Marvel characters. It would only have helped the sales of their own books. If Stan Lee had, for instance, had Captain America assemble a team that included Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, and Daredevil. <laughs> but he didn't do that. Instead, he picked unconventional choices, very unconventional choices. Criminals. Captain America picks three criminals. People with criminal records. Hawkeye had been a villain in an Iron Man story. He's a master archer with all sorts of gimmick arrows uh, and an insubordinate attitude. Captain America picks him for the team. And he also picks the Scarlet Witch and her brother Quicksilver, who are two uh, middle European teenagers who had not only been criminals, but who had been terrorists. They had been part of a terrorist organization led by Magneto, <laughs> the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Captain America picks these three people, and the drama of the storyline is watching them become a team watching Captain America forge them into a team. That process is underway when these issues start. And it was it was pretty unconventional to the sense that uh, the letters columns are full of, of uh, readers writing and saying, well, I don't know how this is going to work. How will this work? One, one reader in rural Iowa wrote in constantly saying, "This not only is, is this not going to work, but it shouldn't work. Why on earth aren't these people in jail? Why would Captain America reward them with membership in an illustrious super team instead of seeing them pay for their crimes? Uh, that that writer from rural Iowa and all the other people who complained would have been wrong. There is an undeniable magic in these issues, especially since Stanley makes the crucial decision to pit that team against menaces that are outside of their power range. They are, for, for one of the only times in this, the entire stretch of 600 issues of the Avengers, the team is an underdog in almost every story, uh, starting right at the beginning when they face a character named Power Man <laughs> in a recurring motif in these issues. The Asgardian character, the Enchantress, who's immortal. She has known Thor forever. She presumably is a subject of Thor's father, Odin the king of the gods. Uh, she's an exile. She's a bad apple in Asgardian terms. I don't know what that would mean if you live for thousands of years. And she has vast sorceress powers. And in the very beginning of the issues collected here, she takes a former henchman of Baron Zemo, uh, who's wandering around in Zemo's shattered headquarters, looking at all of the super equipment by which Baron Zemo created a character called Wonder Man, who was super strong and invulnerable and almost beat the Avengers. Um, this guy's just wandering around in the wreckage of that lab. The Enchantress notices. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe she's got, you know, home security on the place. She appears and says, well, you might not know how to work this super scientific equipment, but I do. No idea why. And as Thor has no technological ability, I had no idea why she would know how to use it. Maybe she saw Baron Zemo do it, but anyway, she uses the equipment, which apparently is still fully functional, uh, to make this thug into a guy named Power Man, who has super strength and invulnerability. The Avengers fought Baron Zemo and his, th and his henchmen and Wonder Man until Wonder Man turned on Zemo in order to help them. The Avengers fought this guy. In the jungles, they watched what this equipment could do to an ordinary, an ordinary civilian. Why they left it? <laughs> Why do you leave that equipment? Why do you do that? And if you you see that the equipment can make a normal person into an unbelievable powerhouse, why not hold uh, tryouts for upstanding citizens of New York to have that done to them as members of the Avengers? Why not, why not have ten power men on the Avengers? Uh, instead, they leave the equipment there, and Power Man, uh, under the Enchantress's guidance, attacks the Avengers, who at this time, don't let this cover fool you, that is Hank Pym, Ant-Man, Giant-Man, who in these issues takes the name of Goliath and a new costume. Um, but in, for, for the beginning, it's these four, Caps, Kooky Quartet, who have to go up against Power Man. For some reason, the Enchantress doesn't want him to fight the Avengers unaided. 
so off to the sidelines she slows them down with her enchantments with her enchantments she hampers their reflexes um eventually that that takes a sideline and the avengers get their tokus's handed to them why that would be true i don't really know especially since that's all that power man is he is super strong and he is invulnerable he can't fly he doesn't have uh, he doesn't have outlandish strength he is certainly containable uh, the key as to why they get their tokus's handed to them is that they are not yet working as a team and later on, once once the Power Man story just up and ends, <laughs> the writing in these is not particularly good. The Power Man story ends because the Enchantress decides, well, you're only a human. I can never love you. So she disappears and he says, well, if, if, I can't, if she can't be my girlfriend, then I'm not going to go on a crime rampage. And he just walks off stage left. At one point, a character says, well, there are no charges against him. <laughs> I guess the Avengers don't consider anything that he did that he did to be worthy of locking him up or maybe using Baron Zemo's equipment to depower him before they let him wander off. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, somebody ought to look at that equipment. Uh, it, it starts there and it moves on from there. There are many, many uh, threats that these Avengers face. They face Doctor Doom, for instance. They face Atuma, who is a... a villain of the Submariners, immensely powerful, and, and also the Collector. Names that crop up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but here you're seeing them for the first time. They also famously face a figure that, uh, I have to think, was Michael K. Vaughn's perverse inspiration for picking these issues. They face Kang the Conqueror, who we've already seen. These great Jack Kirby covers. This run has a whole bunch of great Jack Kirby covers. This is not one of them, <laughs> but there are there are a bunch of them in here. This one is one, for instance. Uh, we have just seen Kang the Conqueror. We've seen as much of him as we'll ever want to see uh, in a three-way read-along that I did with Michael K. Vaughn and Matthew at Maybury Book Club, where we read Avengers Forever, which tells the whole story of Kang the Conqueror and a lot of these events. If you believe the story that Kurt, Kurt Busiek writes in Avengers Forever, then what you're looking at here is some sort of splinter Kang and in mind-controlled Avengers. It's what I was talking about when we were talking about Avengers Forever. It really, if you take it as gospel, it really does throw all of these old issues into a different light. I am largely ignoring it in order to read these issues. I, of course, did not know about it when I was originally buying these issues, but I was having fun. I had this lingering sense of uh, disappointment with the change that Stan Lee had wrought in the Avengers uh, but I still kept buying the issues, and the artwork by Don Heck is terrific. Absolutely great. Just wild and flashy and full of action. I am uh, an outspoken fan of this of this artist, and I remember buying these issues largely for him. I was attracted by the Jack Kirby covers, but I bought the issues largely because I knew that they would be, despite all odds, terrific Avengers stories. And this is a team that attracts crowds. I mean, that you can have a core group of four characters for a while, but it won't stay that way, and it doesn't. These are the issues in which that the roster starts to expand again. First, with two original members, the Wasp and, and Goliath return to the team, and then with Hercules, who had made guest appearances in Thor's comic book. So the, Thor doesn't come back to the team. He is around. He isn't in Asgard this whole time. He isn't incommunicado. He's around. He's just not part of the team. It's kind of a murky question as to why. Iron Man is also around. We see him at one point, Tony Stark, who we see his face with his helmet off, but he's wearing his armor. He's just at home doing that, or presumably having adventures, but not part of the team. Not really explained why that would be the case. Uh, but eventually the the, uh, the roster expands first with uh, Goliath and the Wasp, who have a number of storylines in here. And introduce all sorts of questions, of course. <laughs> they introduce all sorts of questions. Uh, it, it was often remarked by fans at the time that the, introdu the, reintroduction, the reintroduction of Goliath added a much-needed element of raw power to the team, uh, which made at least one reader in rural Iowa ask, well, okay, but... <laughs> Why didn't Hank Pym give Janet Van Dyne the ability to grow to thirty feet tall? <laughs> wouldn't she? Wouldn't that be twice the raw power? She doesn't have that power. In fact, we're we're told in these issues for the first time ever uh, that Janet Van Dyne and Hank Pym have internalized 
the technology, the gas or the circuitry that gave them their size changing power. They can now do it at will. It has become a genuine superpower for them. Uh, not enough, not a lot of emphasis is put on that. And they have adventures with the team until finally Hercules joins. Uh, and then there are even more adventures because suddenly you have the same old chemistry that you had before where you've got a team of normal people and a god. Uh, and in fact, in one of the last pages in this collection, uh, how is it actually put? It struck me at the time. I was, I, uh, I thought it was fascinating even at the time. It's, I believe, at the, uh, the end of the issue where Hercules is stranded on Earth. Yeah, uh, Hercules is stranded on Earth, and uh, the Scarlet Witch says, yet his thoughts are only of Olympus and his bitter exile. And Hank Pym, who, keep in mind, has been with this team from the beginning, he's a founding member of the team, he says, we always wondered why Thor seems so aloof, so distant. Now we know. How lonely it must feel to be a god destined to walk among mere mortals. First inclination, first hint that Stanley has ever given us that the Avengers considered Thor aloof and distant. It would have been very enjoyable if Stanley had been the kind of storyteller who liked to mine details like that. It, instead, he was a very uh, lone ranger, a very pulpy born very World War II, rah-rah, primary color hero, Gene Autry kind of storyteller. And the main story, time, story that he wants to run throughout these issues is the Avengers becoming a team, t starting to take pride in what they do, starting to work as a unit under Captain America's uh, soul-stirring direction, where he's born to be a leader, we're told. Uh, the, that storyline has its face in the conversion of the relationship between Hawkeye and Captain America, which starts off in these issues, continuing from the issues in, in uh, earlier than the ones collected here, in raucous insubordination, Hawkeye believes he that he should be running the team and runs down Captain America every chance he gets, and Captain America bites back, saying, you know, don't make me, essentially take me take you over my knee and paddle some sense into you. But by the in the course of these issues, that becomes that back and forth becomes friendly. Uh, they become partners. They become, uh, they learn, Hawkeye learns to be a team player. Uh, that's the main plot line that's pursued in these issues, that is that, that growth of a team. And it, I have to admit, it's very effective. Uh, I myself would have preferred, would have liked it if in addition to that, Lee and Roy Thomas had explored some of the potentials here some of them. It's never even mentioned in any of the, this run of Cap's kooky quartet. It's never even mentioned that Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch were acolytes of Magneto, that they were terrorists. It's never even mentioned uh, that we don't know who Hawkeye is. Don't the Avengers have a security clearance of some kind? We don't have any idea who he is. In fact, that starts to become evident in these issues when Hawkeye meets the character, a character we've met before, the swordsman, and it, it's immediately obvious that they know each other, that they have a past. Uh, we never learn what the past is. We never learn anything about Hawkeye. We don't even know his name. Uh, he's a proto-Wolverine in that regard. All of you know Wolverine's story backwards and forwards now because of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but for a long time, in the X-Men, when Wolverine was wildly popular as a character, one of the reasons why he was was because nobody knew anything about him. People didn't even know his first name. It was introduced in the Avengers. Uh, they certainly didn't know his origin. The Quicksilver, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are Wanda and Pietro Maximo. They're orphans from the Balkans. <laughs> we know who they are. We know their story. Captain America's story, of course, is well known. So, so much so that Hawkeye refers to him as Steve Arino, Steve Rogers, in public, in front of enemies. Uh, but about Hawkeye, we know nothing. Not even now we do. But at the time that this was done, we knew we knew virtually nothing about him. Also, there's a uh, varying levels of personal experience. We guess we gather that Hawkeye has lots of experience, not just fighting Iron Man, but doing all sorts of other things. Captain America, of course, has a whole world war of experience. But the Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch are teenagers, and sh they're never portrayed that way, and they should be. It would it would have made things more interesting. Likewise, when uh, Janet Van Dyne and Goliath returned to the team, there's almost nothing in the way of friction between them and Captain America. Wouldn't there be? 
they were founding members. Wouldn't they want to take over? Wouldn't they want to take control of the team? They don't ever seem to want to do that. Uh, and that's, you know, that's nothing compared to uh, the the narrative nuances that were possible once you, you have an exiled immortal Hercules on the team. Uh, this just wasn't the time period when any of that stuff would really be explored. Instead, you get more primary color heroics like that, where you've got, uh, at the beginning anyway, before Goliath joins the team, you've got a team that is routinely outmatched by its enemies. Again, that's an untapped potential that I've never really understood. I didn't understand it when I was buying these issues originally. Why this team, the original four there, are considered underpowered. I think the only reason they're traditionally, persistently considered that way is because Stan Lee and after him Roy Thomas don't really explore the potentials here. I mean, we're told over and over again in these issues that Quicksilver, when he's in motion, is moving so fast that he's invisible to normal eyesight. People can't see him. Things move around or get snatched out of hands, and people, the characters say, oh, that must be Quicksilver. If he can move that fast, then why isn't he more effective in combat? I mean, take someone like Power Man, for instance, who's who's super strong and invulnerable. Okay, so if Quicksilver punches him, uh, it's not going to have any effect. But what about... Uh, he's, he's not infinitely strong. He's not Superman. What about, you know, high high tensile strength industrial steel cables couldn't quicksilver wrap him head to toe in those he starts to break free quicksilver could do it 10 times in one minute that would win that would that would beat that villain all by himself whole crowds of thugs with guns if quicksilver can move so fast that he's invisible he could disarm whole crowds of thugs with guns himself before anyone even knew to move he actually does that in one scene in one of these issues and Hawkeye reflects, well, I, I guess he's when when he his sister's in danger, he doesn't kid around. But why would he ever kid around? <laughs> why would why do so many villains seem to be able to see him coming? Is what I'm asking. You've got you know characters like the Thinker or the Living Laser or whatever. Sure, they have uh, fearsome mental capabilities and fearsome weaponry, but Quicksilver could punch them in the right eye a thousand times in a minute, <laughs> which would pulp their heads. The fight would be over. He never does that. That aspect of his powers is never explored. Same thing with Hawkeye. Where does he get these arrows, and what are they capable of? You know, if he can make a blast arrow that can blow a hole through a steel door, as he does a few times in these issues, can he make a blast arrow that can blow a hole through 10 foot of concrete? And if so, why doesn't he use it? And Many, many other things. <laughs> many, many other... What kind of technical capabilities do these arrows have? And what? where does he get his unending supply? I have often maintained, pretty much since the days when these issues were coming out, that it has to be either uh, looted Stark technology or, uh, or uh, reverse-engineered Stark technology. But we learn in uh, only a couple of years after these issues that Hawkeye is... A really talented carnival stumble stumble bomb. Where does he get any kind of advanced technical ability? And then there's the Scarlet Witch. <laughs> Stanley has no idea what to do with her. She has so-called X power, but she's a mutant. She's not a sorceress, or is she? I swear. Stanley and after him, Roy Thomas have no idea. No idea. She is a living Deus Ex Machina. At one point in these issues. She actually has to speak a spell in order to unleash a hex power, even though we're told over and over again that it's not sorcery, it's mutant ability. It would be one thing if she'd grown up in the Balkans, completely untutored by anybody, believing that she was a sorceress, and so thinking that she needs to do that sort of stuff in order to unleash her hex power. And maybe she has to gradually learn that she doesn't have to, sort of like a religious deconversion. That's That plotline is never pursued. Instead, at one point, she speaks a spell. At another point, she, she just offhandedly mentions that if her mouth is covered, she can't use her powers. Uh, at some point, she seems to know what her hex power will do. She seems to want it to do something. At other times, she has no idea. None whatsoever. She is almost alone uh, among Avengers characters for having a physical cost to her ability. We're told that casting hex, ha casting her, you know, 
reality altering hexes drains her over in the fantastic four also uh sue richards is is typically drained when she uses her power a little bit of stanley sexism creeping in there but most of the time it seems like her hex power can't affect living organisms unless she needs to so when she's facing power man for instance the, she says my hexes can stop anyone but what does she do she causes curtains to wrap around his head <laughs> delaying him for a fraction of a second but in in another issue in this collection she uses her hex powers to freeze someone in place so that he can't move well, okay does she know how to do that and if she does well that's wouldn't she do that against everyone at one point when she's angry with hawkeye she sends some sort of an lightning like energy bolt that zaps him obviously in that moment it would have been fairly gentle but can she do that 10 times as strong it's totally untapped potential rereading these issues in this collection just made me think of untapped potential not just for all of the potentials of these characters. I've thought, I think the same thing about the original team of X-Men, which are, you know, I have myself characterized them often as, as underpowered, but they're not. They would be unbeatable if they were used correctly. If they were actually training for combat, they would be unbeatable, almost. Uh, and that's without turning Marvel Girl into Phoenix. That's just by themselves. Same thing with this team. I mean, you get... Uh, uh, the, the letters pages were absolutely full of people writing in saying... Well, it's great to have Goliath on the team because as much as I've been enjoying these issues, it's great to have some raw power back on the team. And I, I, I would always, that would always irritate me a bit because the, the full abilities of this team were never really explored. Um, still, <laughs> these are terrific issues and so are the issues that follow. Uh, but unlike the Marvel Masterwork series, the Epic Collection doesn't go in chronological order. So I don't even know. This is Avengers Epic Collection... Oh, they don't... Yeah, this is Volume 2. Uh, but I don't have any idea what was in Volume 3. It need not have been issues... What was this? 21 to 40? That would have been 41 to 60? Something like that? It need not have been that. I have no idea what Avengers Epic Collection Volume 3 was, but I bet it wasn't the direct continuation of these stories. And who knows when we'll go back to the Avengers. Uh, because, like I say, Michael K. Vaughn is doing the driving, so who knows what next week will be. I think this was probably inspired by Avengers Forever, because we get Kang a little in these stories. Uh, but next week? Oh, who knows? <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> I'll, I'll rejoin you then. Thank you, BookTube.